All right, so next up is uh, Francois here. He's going to talk us about uh, somebody I was just talking to to come to this talk. Uh, they try, they're trying to figure out how to do end-to-end -end testing in their environment. So preview environment sounds rather similar. So take it away, Francois. Thank you. Thank you. Test, test. Do you hear me all well? A bit of ASMR test, test. No? It's fine. Okay. Um, let's start with so implementing previous environments with GitOps in Kubernetes. Uh, first about me, as my accent can show you, I, I'm French, but I am working in Hamburg, Germany with weather maybe a bit different from Spain, from Spain for the one that already visited the, the city. I work at, I'm DevOps engineer at Remazing, which is a mid-sized company, but we have a very small team tech, like roughly 10 persons. So maybe not the same scale at some companies before. And uh, on my free time, I like open source. So I joined the SIG release team of Kubernetes for the last release. And for the summer, uh, I will pause a bit open source and maybe come back in the winter. Uh, about the company, so you can understand what's, uh, why we did preview environment. So it's an agency with a software that we build in-house, we sell to other companies, and this software is multi-tenant, and I will maybe refer it uh, later during the talk as Remdash, and that's for this software that we built previous environments. Uh, so one year ago, again, uh, like not so long ago, we still used a basic uh, workflow for our main software. So we have plenty of microservices, but this one had a simple Git flow. So we had a, a team of developers, and they are pushing to staging, and then you have everything deployed on staging environment. So it's just one branch, staging, deployed, everything fine, and when you want to merge on production, we do it every Monday. Uh, we do a pull request, a release, or a hotfix, and we merge on production, it's deployed in production. It's quite of nice. So imagine someone push a good commit, and you have maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 pull requests uh, before this release day, and someone push a wrong commit. What will happen? It, it, can, it can seem maybe like super simple, and the code looks great, so you have the approval, it's got merge and staging, but yeah, too bad you couldn't test it very well, and staging is broken. So how do you deploy on Monday your features? Because you need to fix this, pro, uh, this first this feature before merging on production. And uh, yeah, it can happen with one pull request, two pull requests, whatever. So let's see a quick list of pros and cons about this workflow. So the first one is quite easy to set up, right? So you have staging environment in your Bitbucket pipeline, YAML, or whatever you use for the pipeline. It's mostly copy-paste, and then use a flag, like production for the production. So super easy, and it's fast. Like if you want to deploy something in production, you just have to create one pull request to staging, and then one pull request to production, and it's easily merged in production, let's say. But you have some cons that are added to those two nice pros. Uh, first one, it's hard to review and test. So let's say someone is going to merge something on staging, you want to review it, you will need to check out on the branch, pull the branch, test everything is working fine, maybe you don't have the same environment, or imagine someone is adding a Redis, you will need to set up in Redis in, in local, it's getting a bit messy, and it's hard to let's just review the pull request or test something easily. Uh, second, it's not the best for new joiners. So imagine you have a new, your new developers joining the team. Uh, they may want to push as much as possible new code to test. OK, let's, let's try to break it to see if it works and without breaking, breaking staging, because staging, a lot of persons are working with staging or QA. But if you, let's say, work with previous environments, which will be a neformal environment aside, you can break it. It's meant to be break, which is very good. And uh, yeah, as I said, other difficulties to test new infra. So let's say you want to test Redis or a mail server, whatever. Uh, it's hard to manually add it to staging without modifying the other features that are on your staging. And last one, as I said before, uh, one pull request, one feature, one branch can break the whole staging which will s then you will need to fix this feature. Uh, without it, you cannot merge to production. So it will slower your time to market. And in a startup environment, let's say, time to market is very important because you want to, to be better than the other tools. So that le led us to this great schema. Uh, and this one is about previous environments and GitOps. So I will say there are two main uh, features why GitOps is useful. Uh, if people there, you want you have other seats, I mean, if you don't want to stand. So about GitOps, 
you have two main features why you want to, to maybe use GitOps with preview environments. Maybe you deploy all your infrastructure or all the, the rest with GitOps principles, and it just copy paste basically to deploy it in previews. Uh, the other part is maybe you want to move to GitOps and start to, I don't know, see how it works, and maybe you don't want to switch directly to production or staging. And preview environments is a step way just before staging or QA, so it allows you to to test basically how GitOps works, different tools like operators, Flux, or Argo. And because it's, um, it's a step before staging, it's very likely to break. So very good, because then you, you can test what happens if you have uh, a wrong, you have a drift, and you need to reconciliate, you have resources breaking, maybe databases you manage. So I would say it's the best way to start GitOps. Uh, as you can see here, it's quite simple. I will go through all the steps, but it's Easily, like often you push code to, like let's say developers push code so, uh, to a code repository, uh, GitHub, Bitbucket. In our case, it's Bitbucket. And the f you will see in the following presentation that Bitbucket has some flaws, let's say, that maybe you don't have with GitHub or GitLab. Uh, so it involves a bit of bash script. Spoil. And uh, so you push your Docker image to a Docker registry, in our case, uh, Docker Hub. And then in another step, you will just commit the environment which is just a YAML file and a Docker tag to make it declarative and reproducible. And we commit this to another repository, Ops repository, where you store all your infrastructure. And then an agent, let's say Argo, we just watch, think, and deploy the change, changes to different namespaces. So in the end, if you have 10 pull requests, you have 10 namespaces in your Kubernetes cluster accessible with different URLs. Uh, yeah, disclaimer, with Argo CD, let's say, uh, you have what's called generators pull request generators, which is doing, like, which, in, which is simplify most of the steps that I will talk about. But for Bitbucket, it's not available yet, so, yeah, <laughs> let's dig a bit into it. Uh, first, some pitfalls I would like to, to new before uh, implementing previous environment. First, GitHub is great when you want to, when you have a working state at the end, because everything is working smoothly, you can trace your commits, you, you can test, like, it's super nice. It's, you feel shaved, let's say. But when you test it, it's a mess, because then you need to push to build an image, wait, everything is committed to the apps repo, so you lose time. So at the beginning, what I would advise is to use a tool like Scaffold that will compact all the steps, build, push, and deploy. Uh, in our case, it was just with Docker and Helm. And we compile everything of this to focus and intensify on maybe uh, just how the deployment will work, how everything will fit for your preview environment. Uh, in our case, we deployed a Laravel application, which is a bit harder than Node.js, let's say, or Go, to deploy because you have PHP, FPM, Nginx, and other stuff. So Scaffold really saved a lot of time. Uh, now let's dig a bit into the Bitbucket pipeline.yaml. So for those of you that are not familiar with Bitbucket, you have one YAML file. And this YAML file, inside of it, you declare everything you want for your pipeline. And so in this case, you can say, OK, I want to listen to two branches. Uh, so all the branches that are matching feature and the other one fixed. Because in our case, we didn't want to deploy a previous environment on a very short-lived branch like Hotfix or something. We want to be as fast as possible. And this one, you trigger two steps. As I said, you build and push to a remote registry, remote Docker registry, how to say. Uh, and the second one, GitHub CD step. So when you commit something to the ops repository. Uh, so yeah. A bit scary. So this one is super simple. It just you log into Docker, you build your image, and you push it to remote registry. But because Bitbucket makes it a bit harder sometimes, there is one step that is good to take a look at is this one. So this one, you export the current tag where your pipeline is building to a bash script, and you will source it later. Because otherwise, what can happen? Let's say you have a slow Docker image building, or maybe your pipeline doesn't have a lot of RAM. You will have you will build one Docker image, and then you will go to the next step, the GitHub step, but then your head of the branch, the head of the branch will change. So with Bitbucket, with this simple like, trick, let's say, you can be sure that the two steps are matching, matching the same tag. Um, yeah, I think that's all we have to say about it. Uh, the second one, which is a mix between CI and CD, it's uh, about still Bitbucket, so second step, GitOps. Uh, first one, we don't want to create a previous environment with master, so we just remove it at the beginning, as you can see here. Let's highlight it. Uh, and then we import 
our environment. So we are sure to match the same tag as we had in the previous step. Otherwise, we will commit something to the ops repo, and Argo will be like, wait, this tag doesn't exist. And then you have your preview that crash. And then we just clone ops repo, add some SSH keys, and commit the application YAML file. So the interesting part here is this one. Um, in the code repo, in our case, we stored the Helm chart. We use Helm uh, inside our, our code repo. So any developer can modify the Helm chart. Let's say you work on a feature that will increase a lot of memory. You can modify the Helm chart, it will deploy, and it will deploy the previous environment with, let's say, more memory. Our developer wants to add Redis for caching database queries. Uh, they can modify it directly on the code repo, and they don't have to touch the infra repo. Uh, and for this, we just modify so a previous file that I will show you, I think, next slide. And we inject like PR ID, PR names, so we can build nice URLs. Uh, you can inject other stuff like the tag of the image for N NPM, NPM, no, FPM, and Nginx. <laughs> and other stuff like this. And then you just commit it, and you push. Uh, yeah, next slide. About the continuous deployment on Argo CD. Um, so for Argo CD, we just install it in the cluster. I mean, you have plenty of documentation about doing it. And in our ops repository, we have one file, the one I told you about uh, with a template. So we have uh, environment variables that will be replaced with our current environment. And inside of it, you put everything you want, like the one which will be useful for the URL. You can put other values file, let's say. Everything is customizable. And Argo will watch this file and deploy it accordingly. And as you can see here, uh, we have the target revision just here to help you a bit more. Uh, this one is set to the branch we are working on, so the, the pull request, let's say. And so every change will be detected by Argo, and Argo will reconciliate. And then why Argo CD? I feel like there is a big, uh, yeah, let's say there are other tools, but in our case, it was mainly, is, do we use Flux or Argo CD? We use Flux for everything related to infrastructure. So Prometheus, Grafana, Ingress Controller, Traffic, uh, Self Manager, Cube, uh, Seed Secrets, whatever. And it's nice, it works nicely, it's a CLI. I mean, I love it. But in a case of preview environments, you want to have developers easily debug what's wrong, what's going on. Uh, what's nicely happening in your cluster. And sadly, beautifully, I don't know, but Argo is way more nicer. Like in one URL, you can see what's happening, how it works. So that's why we kept Flux for the infrastructure and Argo CD to deploy previous environments. Uh, about it, just quickly about the Flux structure. In our case, we have one folder per cluster. We have three, four clusters, so it works nicely. Maybe if you scale up, you want to change this way of working. But in our case, it's working super nicely. You have all your so, uh, tools, like I said earlier, ingress controller, seal secrets, monitoring, whatever. And then Argo CD and your applications will use all those custom resource definitions inside your shards or inside your customizations. So in Argo CD, we manage Argo CD itself by Argo CD in the apps of apps concept. And uh, inside the previous ARM folder, that I can highlight here, that's where we commit all our previous environments. So if you check master branch of Argo CD repository, you will see all the previous environments that are deployed, which make it easy to de delete afterwards. When you close the branch, when you, close the, when you merge a PR, you just delete the file that is uh, responsible for the previous environment. So as well for resources, if you see something, a file that got committed maybe two weeks ago, you may want to delete it. Why do we have a feature open for two weeks? We want to merge fast and to test features. Uh, then the biggest, I would say, uh, problem <laughs> is uh, GitOps. When you start to use GitOps, uh, you always have this way where you start to committing your secrets to a repository, hopefully a local, I mean, a private one that you just test stuff in. But then later, you want to just store your secrets. So let's say database credentials or anything like uh, API keys, uh, Docker Hub secrets to access your private registry. And in our case, we use seal secrets. So it's super easy. You just install kube secret, uh, seal secret, and you have a small CLI to use it. And what you will commit is only the seal secret part, which is a CRD. And this will be encrypted with a key of our, our controller. 
So no one has access to this key except the controller. So you can give ops or admins access to this key, and only them can encrypt secrets. And so then you can commit safely to Git. Uh, it's the easiest way we found. I know there are a vault or whatever that you can use, but as let's say fast to implement, it was kind of very good. And then in your cluster, you have the secrets. Uh, additional tip, if you use Helm, let's say, you can use conditions, so simple if. Okay, if you are deploying, uh, let's say, a production environment or you are testing with local, you can use a different uh, secret file that you encrypted with maybe your local kind cluster key or your staging cluster or whatever, which makes it easier to test because then depending on the values file you use, you can use different secrets. You don't have to every time get the, the key of the controller and then encrypt again your secret, etc. cetera. Uh, then let's talk about the multi-tenants. So for our applications at our company, Rendash, uh, we have a multi-tenant setup. And for every previous environment, so for every pull request created, we want a URL. And for each URL we have, we want a client on top of it. So anyone can, you can test different clients. If you seed clients, you can test them easily. And it causes a bit of problems because at the beginning we hard coded on traffic, uh, the wildcard, and then how do you do this? Do you modify the traffic manifest, which is at the core in another infra repo because it's just a tool that's used in the cluster. It's not in the Argo CD repo. So what we use is we combine traffic as ingress controller and self manager, another tool that will manage HTTPS. A great thing about self manager, it's, it will give you as well high availability because then traffic won't have to manage the, all the secrets and stuff. So those two working together are deployed with Flux, and I will show you next up. Um, so that's how we manage, like let's say, infrastructure to previous environment. So in one side, you have all the self manager stuff. So you have the Helm repository with CM for self manager. So we install self manager with Flux. We have our cluster issuer on, uh, responsible for DNS, wildcards. And or in our case, digital ocean secret, but you can put any cloud provider secret, Cloudflare, whatever. And with this, once it's set up, all the previous environment stuff, all the Argo will use those resources. So for each environment that you commit, you will have a certificate, which inside of it, the name of the URL you want to give it, and it will generate you a wildcard. And then ingress route, matching the secret created by the certificate, and you will have wildcard on the flow. So for any pull request created, you have wildcard certificate, uh, which is, I find, super nice. No need to SSH into the pods, install certbot, whatever. Uh, let's, another challenge we had to, to go through, let's say, with, what our, with our Elasticsearch database is the hooks. We have Helm, and that's how we deployed at the beginning. And with Helm, you can easily match them with hooks on Argo CD. So hooks, which basically say, OK, every time you reconciliate and you deploy something, or you yeah, in post-install mode, you will just run a job, for example. And then you can run long-running operations uh, after each deployment. In our case, we want everything text-related to be indexed. And so it runs on the flow. It's super nice. And you can imagine, I don't know, applying to whatever you want. So if you want to seed new clients, new data, uh, yeah, testing fake data, you can do it on every deployment. You can even maybe like wipe the database and reseed re with uh, random data. Everything makes it easy. Um, then about namespace. I don't know who is using Lens here, but then it's super nice because you can you have a drop down and you can see all the your namespaces in your Kubernetes cluster. But as well, when you do uh, kubectl get namespaces, after a while, imagine, I don't know, you release 20 pull requests per week or way more depending on the size of your organization, you will have a huge list of namespaces. And then you will start to grab into the namespaces to find the good one. It's a mess. So an easy way to do it with Argo, you can create the namespace easily with adding just one option, but you cannot delete it easily. And so if you create a namespace resource, then Argo, when you delete the previous environment file, will go through all the resources, secrets, whatever, delete them, and then at the end, we'll delete the namespace itself. So you don't hang up with uh, empty namespaces in your cluster. Uh, now let's talk about developer experience, because the main goal of previous environment is to improve, let's say, time to market, developer velocity. Like the, you want to push commits, like to test better features and to push more commits. So yeah, a bit of bash, 
not so hard though. Uh, before deploying, we check if in our ops repository there is an environment file, so as you can see, first line. And if so, we just commit on the pull request. So I'm sure there are other tools to notify, we try Slack, but the best is still on the pull request, you left a comment, okay, this is the URL of your previous environment. So when a developer needs to test, they open the pull request, they have their automated commit, they click on it, and they have their previous environment where they can do anything they want. They can break anything they want, slow down the release that will soon come to production. They can try to break it, and that's what we want. If the, uh, the previous environment is broken, that's good, because no, no clients, no, no one cares if the previous is, bro is broken. It's meant to be broken. Uh, another one is, the good thing with Argo CD is the UI. So you want to expose this UI to give it access to your users or developers. I mean by users, I mean developers. Uh, so you can easily add an ingress route. Let's say you have uh, traffic, so you add an ingress route. You can secure it with passwords. You can use roles with Argo CD. So you just want to give a read-only role to your developers so they can just see what's happening. And if something breaks, they can push some fixes. And yeah, they can just see in a nice way what's happening. And if you don't trust uh, into having, let's say, an operator such Argo CD that controls your cluster with an open URL, even behind a basic auth and passwords and roles, you can still keep power forwarding and give access only to this power forward, power forward and then your developers can access Argo CD. Um, almost done with the DX. So about the webhook, Argo CD will reconciliate every X minutes. So I don't know what's the default, five, two. Uh, but to speed up a bit the things, especially if your Docker build time is taking long, uh, you can use what's called a webhook. So I, I guess everyone is familiar. And you can set it up with Bitbucket easily. And then every time you have a change on your ops repo, it will just reconcilize, reconciliate the state and you will have faster deployments. And last, I just wanted to add the slide because it's useful. Uh, you can give some, like, say, bash commands to easily SSH into a pod to debug for the developers, or let's say to forward a database connection, a mail server that will catch all the emails to test. Um, it's kind of nice, a bit dirty, but it works well. And tips, depends on your maturity and security. But at the beginning, we were pre, uh, pre we are, like, let's say, refusing root to the containers, but then you cannot install packages if you want to debug. You cannot like SSH and then start to create files, modifying stuff. So in the end, for previous environment, not production, uh, I think it's a good idea to just allow root to debug. But that's a closed environment, like, so it's fine. And last but not least, thanks to uh, FlexCD maintainer, uh, King Don, I think, on the Slack, and if you have questions, Slack channels are great, like CNCF or Kubernetes. Uh, he told me about this Renovabot, which is a life changer, honestly. So the problem with installing resources is over the time you have upgrade patches or security issues that happens, or maybe you will, I don't know, stay for one year to the same 0 0.5 versions, and you want to upgrade automatically. And you can run this bot on Bitbucket. Um, so it will just run, let's say, weekly, daily, depending on how you trigger your pipeline automatically, and then create pull requests. You would say, okay, your, let's say, your low-key instance needs to be upgraded. You can change the change logs. Okay, you compare what's changing. Do I need to do something manual? Maybe remove some CRGs, I don't know. And then you just click Merge, and you have up-to-date clusters and tools. So, great tool. And that was the last slide. So, thanks for everyone to listening. Maybe change a bit of, I don't know, huge clusters and stuff, but that's how we do it in-house and previous environments really helped. Now you can really easily test features, and with GitOps, it's a nice way to, to start using GitOps, let's say, before going to production, and maybe if something breaks, you don't want, I don't know, bad things to happen. And that's it. Thanks, especially GitOpsCon and KubeCon. If you have any questions, let me know. Any questions? Coming back. Also, if you have a chair that's open next to you, raise your hand. We have people standing over here. So, so you mentioned that you're, you're using Flux CD for infra and um, Argo, Argo CD for developers. Why that split? I understand the Argo CD part for the UI and everything, but then why for uh, uh, yeah, why Flux? So at the beginning, 
It was just a random choice, let's say. Let's pick Flux, it looks great, it's uh, working well with the Helm. Uh, so I started with, with Flux. And then when doing something for developers, uh, CLI, I mean, CLI is not the best like, to, to see quickly a change. You need to learn a CLI tool and stuff. So the UI of Argo CD, I checked there was an old project from uh, Flux to have a UI, but it doesn't seem like continuated or well updated. Why not migrate to Because it's like Flux is doing production environment and it's working great, and I don't want to, to move to Argo CD yet. I mean, maybe in six months, one year, we are mature enough to migrate to Argo CD. But in an environment, let's say, where it's not critical, it's nice to test stuff. So you can both test something nice, and at the same way, it's not critical. I, I don't want to move production environment or uh, production resources on something just as a test, you know. As a co-chair, uh, I see a lot of people doing exactly that. Like, their actual infrastructure is spun up with Flux, the applications are spun up with Argo. It's totally normal and fine to use both. You don't have to go all in on one. That's the beauty of Kubernetes and GitOps. Any other questions? You have one? Uh, great talk. Um, I'm just curious to see where application sets fits into all of the preview environment setup that you have. Have you considered it at all within the Argo ecosystem? Wait, can, you, can you repeat just because? Application sets. Yes. So for application sets, we don't use them because uh, we don't need to, let's say, have the same setup. I mean, application, application, application set, still hard to say. Um, it seems really good for if you want to generalize stuff and to maybe deploy to several clusters or stuff. But in our case, it's working great. And maybe we'll move to application set, application set later. Uh, I saw, I mean, I wish that the Bitbucket is integrated into the pull request generator, which, was ma which will make listening on events way like, faster and better. And we can ditch the whole, I guess, commit part inside the pipeline. So yeah, future step. But so much to do, like observability, monitoring. <laughs> we need to prioritize. And uh, yeah, I would say that's it. Maybe there was a question there. Yeah, nice. Yeah, just wanted to know uh, how long does it take on average to provision a new environment? And have you taken any shortcuts to bring that time down? Uh, so what's the longest part is the Docker build image, because especially with Laravel, we, it's kind of heavy, and you need to build Nginx, PHP, FM, we use Mix, so you need to pull a part of the image in the back end, it's a bit of a mess. <laughs> but to deploy the environment is super fast, because we use some, uh, let's say, sub shots, like for Redis or MySQL, so everything starts quite easily. Uh, it's not resource intensive because it's just a Laravel app. It's not like you start, I don't know, a huge Prometheus cluster or whatever. Uh, so it's super fast. I wouldn't say in minutes, but for the build time, it's roughly five minutes. And then to commit, Bitbucket is a bit slow, I would say. No offense if there are Bitbucket uh, people here. But I don't know, it's a bit slow to like get the cache, set up everything. But once it's committed to Argo, you have the webhook triggering, and then it's instantly you see the, the synchronization starting, refresh. And it's super nice to see, to see like, how fast it is once it's in the repo. Awesome. Any other questions? All right. Hang on. OK. Thanks very much. Oh, there is one. One more. Yeah, I have one question. Uh, so we also have a similar setup uh, using Flux, actually, in that case. And uh, the biggest challenge currently we have is uh, executing end-to-end -end tests for applications. Okay. How do you deal with that? So with end testing, we use Cypress. And Cypress use just the same, like, the same test as we have on staging. So we just run on the URL we have. And then Cy you know Cypress, maybe? OK, so we're just doing end testing easily. And if you want to add tests on the Docker image, you would just add Docker build, Docker push. And in between, you just build it with, a te with the test tools and run the test. So if it breaks, it even breaks before deploying to the, the previous environment. So they just, you have an alert, like, oh, the pipeline broke. And, yeah. So you switch completely to a different framework here. So we have lots of uh, existing applications. Hmm? I mean, 
I guess you have several ways to trigger it. Maybe you can run like your end-to-end -end testing as like a post-install job, a ham job, that will run some smoke testing and other test, conformance tests you want to have on your cluster. I mean, you have so many options, you can run them in the pipeline, maybe. After it's got deployed, then you wait until the state is reconciliated and you deploy your test. Or the way I will use it is with a Helm, I mean Helm, Argo CD uh, hooks. And then you wait everything to be deployed and you start your testing. We don't have those hooks in the flux. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe one reason to use Argo for previews. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You have great tools and just use what yeah, works the best, I would say. Great, thank you. Thank you awesome. very much. Thank you, Francois.